Hi, welcome to the Museum of Human Disease. My name's Adam, I run this museum. We are a macropathology museum. So we house a couple of thousand human tissue specimens that show changes due to disease that we can see with the naked eye. We don't need to use microscopes or anything like that to see them. And we use this to show the effects of diseases when we're teaching about pathology to medicine students and medical science students here at the Kensington campus at UNSW. But we also do a lot of work with the wider university community as well as the general public and several thousand high school students who come here every year to learn more about disease in the body as well. We're looking at environmental factors today and a great way to illustrate this is what we call pneumoconiosis, which means dust diseases. And we can see this effect in some of our lung specimens. So different dusts and inhaling different dusts can cause different forms of pneumoconiosis, but they all land within a sort of similar range of effects. So we can illustrate this with a few different things. The first one we like to look at is what we call coal miner's lung, which is exactly what it sounds like. This is from inhaling coal dust, and we often see it in people who worked in coal mines. Now, practices have changed over the years of how coal mining works, but because most of our specimens come from the 1960s and earlier, uh, we can see how things worked without much in the way of health and safety and ventilation. This lung came from someone who was a 35-year veteran of working in a coal mine. He actually died at the age of 55. And you can see here just the color change. You've got all this black buildup of carbon dust from breathing in that coal throughout the years. Uh, that would have had a significant effect on his breathing. So the particles of coal are actually quite large by the standards of the different dust diseases we're going to look at. And they build up. It takes a while for this kind of coal dust buildup to actually show some effects. This guy had reported that in the last few years of his life, he would get very fatigued and puffed out just walking across rooms. So at this point, there is a very, very large effect. But a lot of people, particularly people who live in cities, are going to have some form of carbon build up just from air pollution throughout their lives. And we can see this in a one that's not really that related to pneumoconiosis. This is actually a specimen showing lung cancer. But you can see the paler brown tissue here is relatively healthy, but there's lots of black spots throughout it. And there's different reasons that black spot can start to build up. Now, because this person had lung cancer, there's a reasonable chance that they were a smoker, and smoking can cause these carbon deposits to start to build up. But so can living in a city like Sydney, for example, and breathing in that air pollution over years. And even though that this lung isn't in great shape and has a lung cancer, at this kind of concentration, those carbon buildups aren't going to cause that many noticeable problems. Uh, but once it starts to get to that larger buildup, as we saw in the coal miner's lung, that starts to cause a lot of problems. Another similar one is something we're starting to see a lot more of at the moment, and it has been in the news. This is a lung with what we call silicosis, and it's from breathing in rock dust. So those rock dust particles are a lot smaller than the coal dust particles, and they start to build up in the lung and can cause scarring in the lung. And we've seen an increase in this lately because of engineered stone and things like Caesar stone being used in stone bench tops. People who cut those bench tops uh, often don't have adequate protection or have too much exposure to that dust in the atmosphere. They breathe in too much of it. So this can lead to lots of damage and scarring building up in the lungs. And once the lung tissue starts scarring, it makes the lung a lot less elastic. It means those little pockets where we get oxygen out of the air become a lot more damaged and it becomes harder for people to breathe. So that's an effect we can start to see once those little particles start making their way deep into the lungs there. With this one right up close, it does actually have some of those carbon deposits building up as well. So this might have been someone who worked in a coal mine too but breathe in a lot more rock dust than they did carbon dust. And you can see all these tiny little white lines coming out of those black spots are scarring because of that silicosis as well. Then we can move on to a very famous dust disease. And this has very, very small particles. And this is one that we call asbestosis. So it comes from breathing in asbestos. So asbestos was a material used in things like fireproofing and construction and other industries uh, throughout the 20th century until people realized that tiny little fibers of asbestos, if they were inhaled, could stay in the lung 
and cause constant damage over years. And that can lead to a number of things. In this lung, towards the bottom, the lung tissue has really started to break down. Scarring has occurred. This looks like there might have been some kind of infection would have been encouraged here and started to build up. We can see big concentrations of blood that have built up in the lung as well. And another risk from asbestosis is that it can also lead to lung cancer. And you can see a large cancer over here. This big mass is a tumor that's formed inside the lung as well. So those are different ways that environmental pollutants can actually affect the lungs. Sometimes diseases can jump from animals to humans. And there's a couple of ways that this might happen. One is when we have an animal life cycle for parasitic diseases that can jump to a human. And a great example of this is hydatid cysts in the liver in particular. So a hydatid cyst is caused by a hydatid tapeworm. The regular life cycle for this is the tapeworm infecting a sheep. And then the sheep has cysts form in its flesh. Say an animal like a dog eats that flesh, which means the tapeworm gets into the dog and the dog will poo out the tapeworm into its feces and the sheep will eat the feces in the process of eating grass and that cycle keeps continuing. But particularly for, say, farmers, that protects the, presents the risk of tapeworms directly infecting them. And if that happens, the tapeworm isn't that adapted to infecting humans and what will happen is the tapeworm will eventually end up in the liver of a human and once it's there, it will just start laying eggs. And that will continue over time, and it forms what we call a cyst. So this is a slice of someone's liver, and this big sort of gelatinous area in the middle here is the hydatid cyst. So that is thousands of tapeworm eggs that have been laid over a number of years. It's destroyed liver tissue in the process and just carved out this big cyst, and a cyst is a fluid-filled sac or space. Uh, but a lot of the time this goes unnoticed for quite some time as well. So this was only discovered posthumously. The person who had this cyst didn't know about it during their life. And this can be treated as well, both with medication and if necessary with surgery as well. And particularly because the liver is very resilient uh, and can actually grow back new cells, it can repair its damage quite well. Often this isn't a terrible thing to happen. This can be recovered from quite well. But in another sense, we have what we call zoonotic diseases. So these are when diseases that affect animals find their way into humans and can suddenly use humans as a viable host. And COVID is a fantastic example of this. Now, there's a little bit of speculation and a little bit of research and a little bit of evidence that sort of gives us an idea of where COVID came from. A lot of people think things like, for example, a bat. Uh, it was a virus that was present in a bat, which then jumped to maybe another animal, which then jumped to humans. And the big problem with zoonotic diseases, there's a couple of them. One is that humans are more and more encroaching into wild areas that didn't used to have humans, which means they have animals with diseases that haven't seen humans for thousands or tens of thousands of years, which means our immune systems aren't used to these diseases. And when that happens, the chances of a zoonotic disease becoming viral in a human increases a lot. The chances of it becoming a bad pandemic, like with COVID, increases a lot as well. The second way we can see zoonotic diseases becoming more of a problem is things like climate change. This can change the habitat of different animals and other vectors that would deliver diseases to humans. And we're already seeing some evidence of this with certain mosquito-borne diseases moving further and further out of tropical zones into what used to be subtropical zones. And of course, changing climate on the planet means that there's larger areas that those mosquitoes can move into and potentially infect humans as well. It's also good for us to look at different ways of measuring things. Now, measurement is a very vital thing in our society and it has changed over time. And we can see this with a couple of historical measuring tools that we have here in the museum. One is how we used to measure weight or mass. Uh, these days we have scales that we place something on and the scales will tell us how much something weighs. This is either the older versions where putting something on the scales would stretch out a spring and that spring was attached to a needle which would end up wherever the weight was. And then that's advanced to electronic scales, which will have things like, for example, a piezoelectric sensor that tells a computer how much pressure is being put on the plate. And then the little computer screen will show how much weight is there. And they're very good. 
but they're maybe not 100% as accurate as what we used to use because they're approximating the weight. They're not directly measuring the weight, they're measuring how much a spring deforms or how much a sensor is being pressured. But for our purposes, they're usually good enough. Back in the day though, we used to use one of these. So these are manual scales, and you still see some of these around today. I mean, it's often used in uh, logos for law and legal practice. But with a scale, on one side you would put the thing you want to measure the weight of, and the other side you would put a set number of metal weights. And that's these weights here. So these would be measured out very accurately by the manufacturer. They would have, say, 1 gram, 10 grams, 50 grams, or down into the micrograms, for example. Uh, and you would put as many of these weights on the scales as it would take to balance with what you were trying to measure. The advantage of that is it's incredibly accurate. The real disadvantage is it's annoying and fiddly because essentially you have to figure out what the weight is. You have to put enough weights on to balance it. Uh, so that can be a bit of a trial and error process. So for the sake of losing a tiny bit of accuracy, these days we have a lot more convenience in how we measure things as well. And the good thing was these didn't have to be calibrated as often as we do need to do with our scales these days. We want to get an accurate answer as well. But another way we've changed measurement is how we do what we call cytometry, which is counting different types and numbers of blood cells in a blood sample. Uh, and this was used in the old days. So in order to count, say, how many red blood cells and different types of white blood cells were in a blood sample, someone would have to sit over a microscope and manually count them. And as they would go, they would use this to actually enter the number of cells that were in. So they've got, you know, one for lymph cells, one for red blood cells, one for different types of white blood cells, and they would press a button each time they saw a different one in this sample. Obviously that has lots of scope for mistakes because if you've got to count hundreds of different cells and you're staring down at this tiny little microscope slide, it's very easy to lose track of what you have and have not counted. So it's also very tedious work. But these days we've done away with this and use what we call flow cytometers. So that's where you can actually take a blood sample, put it into a machine that flows the blood sample through something like a light or a laser detector, which can actually distinguish those different cells and use a computer to recognize them and count them. That's much easier and much quicker. So a lot of the time we have teachers come in who are former pathology lab workers and they look at these and are like, oh my God, no, no don't take me back there. So that's a very big improvement in how we measure something.